Well, today I'm going to return to the situation in Ukraine. And there's a number of new or fresh developments, some rather disturbing uh, uh, and worrying and suggesting that the situation, um, th that there is an attempt by Ukraine to expand the war into Moldova, which um, I think is very alarming and very mal alarming also for the Moldovan authorities. But before I do that, there's a number of quick points about the general situation I want to say. First is that the British Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, made a rather interesting statement to Parliament about British military aid to Ukraine. He appeared to deny that Britain is actually going to be providing self-propelled howitzers to Ukraine, for example. But he also gave a figure for what he claimed were Russian casualties over the course of the war, which he said was 15,000 dead. Now, I should say straight away that I don't take any of these figures about the numbers of Russian casualties at all seriously. A few weeks ago, there were claims in the British media, for example, that the Moskva, the Russian ship, the cruiser that sank in the Black Sea, went down with all hands. The Russians have now provided casualty figures for the number of people lost in the sinking of uh, Moskva. They said that one person is confirmed dead and 27 are missing, confirmed dead, uh, pro probably dead, but most, pro but most by far the greater part of the crew was saved. And I think this is true. I, I don't take any of these figures seriously. And I, for the record, I don't think that Russian losses come anywhere close to 15,000 dead or any such number. But what's more interesting is that the 15,000 figure that Ben Wallace gave is essentially the same figure that was being floated around the Western media, um, obviously coming from Western intelligence agencies, but also ultimately, I presume, from Ukraine, way back in mid-March. Now, if you accept that, then if you accept that, if you think about about that, that's some that comes across as a, if you like, an admission that from Ben Wallace that um, Russian losses since mid March have been rather low, or you could interpret it that way. Either those figures that were being floated around in March were wrong, which by the way they probably were, but of course the British government isn't saying that. Or alternatively, um, Russian losses have reduced significantly since March. I suspect, by the way, both are true. I think these figures, as I said, are inflated. But I think most probably there has been a significant fall in Russian casualties over the last few weeks, mostly because of the nature of the fighting that is now taking place in Donbass, where um, most of the fighting, or what is described as fighting, is massive artillery shelling by the Russian military of Ukrainian forces. And we've had a very interesting article um, um, in Politico, which describes the current situation. I should say here that I learned of this article from um, the Moon of Alabama, from Bernhardt at the Moon of, Moon of Alabama. But the article is titled, Heavy Weaponry Pours into Ukraine as Commanders Become More Desperate. And it talks about how the West is providing heavy weaponry, which means essentially artillery to Ukraine. But then it goes on to say those deliveries are coming amid increasingly desperate pleas from Ukrainian battlefield commanders as they endure withering Russian artillery and rocket fire that could last weeks or months. And then we have a rather sad account of from a, um, a, a Ukrainian officer, First Lieutenant Ivan Skuratovsky, serving in the 25th Airborne Brigade of the Ukrainian Army. And he apparently told Ukraine that he needs help to come immediately. 
and uh, Politico quotes him as saying the situation is very bad. Russian forces are using scorched earth tactics. They simply destroy everything with artillery, shelling day and night. And I don't know how much strength we will have. Um, and um, he tells Politico that if help doesn't arrive, and he by help he actually means air support, not artillery, uh, but air support and extra manpower doesn't arrive in the next few days, his troops could find themselves in the same position as those in Mariupol. In other words, as the same position as those troops bottled it, blottled up in the Azovstal factory. And he says that um, he's uh, at least 13 of his troops um, have uh, uh, been wounded in recent weeks. That's the amount that he's admitting to. Remember, he's only a first lieutenant, so he's presumably in charge of, a pl uh, you know, platoon. Um, and he says that his troops have gone without rest since the start of the war. And importantly, he goes on to say that his troops are running dangerously low on ammunition and that this has reduced them to rationing bullets. And the day before, he told Politico that his soldiers were being bombarded with Russian howitzers, mortars, and multiple launch rocket systems at the same time. And just hours earlier, he said they had been attacked by two Suhoi-25 um, warplanes, Russian warplanes, and our day became hell. And he said that he gave a message, apparently, to the United States and other NATO countries. I would like to tell them that grenade launches are good, but against airstrikes and heavy artillery, we will not be able to hold out for long. People can no longer endure daily bombardments. We need air support now. We need drones. Now, air support, in terms of... Um, Airstrikes by Western aircraft against uh, Russian artillery in Ukraine, that doesn't seem at all plausible to me. I cannot personally believe at the moment that that is coming. That would amount to a massive escalation. And um, opinion polling that I've seen in the United States suggests that the American people, at least, would be strongly opposed to such a thing. So... There's a meeting at the moment by Western defence ministers about how to step up military aid to Ukraine. But from what I can tell, they are talking about providing more weapon systems of the kind that they've already provided, artillery and the rest, in nowhere near sufficient numbers to make up for Ukrainian losses. And they're certainly not going to provide the air support that Lieutenant First Lieutenant Skuratovsky says he needs. I'm going to add, by the way, in connection with all of this, that um, drones, which he refers to, are apparently proving something of a disappointment. Zelensky himself has now admitted in various comments that the Bayraktar drones, the famous Turkish Bayraktar drones, have proved ineffectual against Russian air defence and electronic warfare systems. And I'm getting increasingly the impression that the same is, has turned out to be true of the US-supplied switchblade kamikaze drones, that the Russian electronic warfare systems, the ability of the Russians to block out GPS and to interfere with the signals of these drones means that they're not operating, they're not as effective as the Ukrainians and perhaps the Americans expected. There's a report that the US ha is now intending to supply um, Ukraine with a different drone, supposedly called the ghost drone, which is being adapted to Ukrainian conditions and which is based on the switchblade. That looks like a cack handed admission to me that the switchblade has failed. Um, one wonders how much more effective 
it, this new drone will be? And I suspect the answer is that it won't be particularly effective because whatever step the um, US takes to modify the switchblade to make it more effective, I suspect that the Russians will be able to devise countermeasures and they'll be able to counter the switchblade and the ghost and any other such drone that the US supplies. So drones are still useful to Ukraine because they provide some surveillance capabilities, but for ground attack, they're not proving anywhere near as effective as some people expected. And it strengthens my um, feeling that the beliefs that many people ran away with after the Armenian-Azerbaijan war, that Turkish drones were somehow some kind of miracle weapon on the battlefield, that those assumptions have proved to be wrong. In the meantime, is this heavy artillery bombardment, this massive artillery shelling of the Ukrainian troops in, Ukra in Donbass continues. We get reports of more incremental Russian advances. It seems that the Russians are now close to severing road and rail links to uh, uh, Donbass. They've launched missile strikes against railway bridges and uh, um, electric railway electric substations, making it difficult for locomotives, electric powered motivotives to travel across Ukraine. And there's also some reports that the Russians are edging ever closer to cutting road, to actually positioning their troops on the actual remaining road and railway links, finally cutting off the Ukrainian forces in Donbass from any further hope of resupply. And this comes shortly after Zelensky himself admitted that Ukraine lacks the means to rescue the troops in the Azovstal factory. It can only do that if you analyze Zelensky's words carefully with the support of other militaries. In other words, we, he can't rescue the troops in Azovstal, save unless without direct US or Western military intervention in the conflict. And I have to say, I'm getting increasingly the sense that the Ukrainians themselves, probably they've understood this for a long time, but they're coming round increasingly to the view that Western military intervention is their only real hope. And we're starting to see that they're beginning to take measures which look like intended to expand the war in order to try to involve Western countries in it. So we've seen what look like what indisputably appear to be Ukrainian attacks on installations in the breakaway Moldovan region of Transnistria, where there is a major Russian base. There was an attack on the headquarters of the security service in Transnistria. And there's also been some kind of an attack on a radio, radio or radar station a radio station in Transnistria as well. And I gather that the Moldovan government, which is desperate to avoid being drawn into the war, is deeply unhappy about this. But some Ukrainian commentators have openly said that Ukraine's only real chance now is to try to extend the war into Moldova to, uh, in the hope possibly that that will involve the Western powers though the rationalization is to try and seize Russian personnel in Transnistria and exchange them for the people in places like Azovstal and elsewhere. By the way, if they do that, if the Ukrainians do that, I don't think it will work. And I get to add something else. I think that if Ukraine does try to extend the war into Moldova, there will be a very strong Russian reaction and it will reinforce those like General Minakayev, the deputy commander of Russia's central military district, who 
have spoken about Russia extending its land bridge all the way from Kherson region to Transnistria, the border of Transnistria, cutting Ukraine off entirely from the sea, capturing places like Nikolaev and Odessa. So it would be a dangerous extension of the war. It's one that ultimately would be extremely, I suspect, alarming from the Western powers. And of course, it would be um, one which could cause unpredictable consequences, but which the most likely outcome of which would be a result catastrophic for Ukraine. And this, by the way, brings me to something else, which is this trip to Kiev by um, Blinken and Austin, the US Secretary of State and the US Secretary of Defense. And there's been not very much said about this trip, actually. Blinken made some really extraordinary comments about, you know, how Russia has failed in its objectives in Ukraine. It's the kind of things you'd expect from him. And uh, there was also talk about how the whole project is to supposedly weaken Russia. I would only say this. You can only weaken a country by it, through war by defeating it in war. Countries that win wars tend to come out of them stronger, even if that war takes longer than might have been expected. And I would certainly expect that to be the case in this case. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But anyway, um, one wonders what was said in Kiev and whether the officials who met with Austin and Blinken actually discussed or floated by them these really rather reckless ideas of trying to expand the war into Moldova as well. I'm going to say, by the way, that I strongly believe, though of course I have no proof, that the fire at the Bryansk refinery within Russia was probably also the result of some kind of Ukrainian sabotage attack or perhaps Tochka missile strike. Um, it is embarrassing and annoying for the Russians, but it is, in terms of the military operations, merely a pinprick. And it's the kind of thing I suspect the Ukrainians are trying to do in order to distract the Russians, to, to distract their Russians from their focus on this relentless demolition of the Ukrainian army in Donbass. I think that whatever the Russians do in terms of the provocations in Moldova, and these, as I said, um, attacks on installations in Russia, the primary thing will be for the Russians, I mean, I'm not a military person, but this is what I'm going to guess, to continue this focus on destroying the Ukrainian army in Donbass. It always seems to be, to me, at least this is what I've always found, that in life, if you have a plan, which looks like a successful plan, the best thing to do is to stick by it and not be distracted by uh, attempts by your adversary to distract you. Certainly that's the case, in my opinion, when applying legal strategies. Maybe military affairs are different. But I'm going to give an example. It seems to me that the fighting in Mariupol took longer than perhaps was intended because the many of the forces from the, the militia of the Donetsk People's Republic that had been committed, originally committed to the capture of Mariupol were diverted north following a to Totchka missile strike on the city of Donetsk and have subsequently been involved in heavy positional battles trying to crack very strong Ukrainian fortifications in the area around Donetsk, when in fact, in military terms, it would have probably made more sense for them to have stayed and seen through the battle in Mariupol and brought that to a conclusion faster. Whilst I'm on the topic of Mariupol, by the way, I should say that um, uh, the attempt by the Russians, again, 
to give the Ukrainian troops and the civilians in Mariupol time to come out of the Azov-style factory, to lay down their arms. Um, well, that offer uh, was not realized. But I remain of the view that before very long, we will see these people in the Azov-style factory essentially do that which the Russians are demanding of them. I say that because unless they decide to do something wholly wrong, which is to say, follow the example of, well, shall we say the zealot fighters who laid down their lives and, and in Masada during the war, the, the Jewish war against the Romans, something of that kind. I don't really see what other choice they have. If they really are running out of food and supplies, then at some point they have to come out and accept Russian terms. And I hope that is what they do. I would say that there are some reports that Ukrainian, the Ukrainian troops in Azovstal, who are now very much at the end of their tether, are apparently, according to some reports, finally losing faith in the political leadership in Kiev, and maybe that will strengthen their, the, the momentum towards them doing that which they are intending to do, which is to lay, lay, eventually to come out and surrender to the Russians, as I certainly think they should. Anyway, that seems to me an overview of the military situation. Um, I want to just touch on two, um, very, two particular things uh, that have also happened. The, the Turkish government um, has said that it is no longer going to allow uh, Russian um, overflights of Turkey uh, taking civilians and uh, military people to Syria, from Russia to Syria. And this has been presented by many people as a hardening of the Turkish position against Russia. I disagree. The Turks know perfectly well that the Russians do not need to send, to fly their troops over Turkey in order to resupply their troops in Syria. They are easily able to send their troops via Iran in Iraq. Might take a little longer, but it's not a huge problem. I think the reason the Turks did that is because the Turks have made it absolutely clear that they are not going to support any move by the Western powers, as some some have floated, to send naval forces into the Black Sea, supposedly in order to help uh, escort grain shipments and food shipments and other such things from Odessa. The Turks are un absolutely clear that they're not going to agree to any NATO deployments in the Black Sea. I think they've acted to scotch that idea but in order to maintain balance, they've taken this token step of blocking Russian overflights to Syria. Much more important have been Mr. Putin's various comments in Russia. And he has just attended two very important um, um, meetings, which have both taken place in Moscow. The first was a meeting on the situation in the Russian economy. Now, he's provided an overview of the situation, and he says that things in the economy are getting better. And this is what he says. I would like to st emphasize that the economy continues to stabilize. Inflation has slowed. Weekly price increases have approached normal less, less levels, and prices on some, some goods have started dropping. Analysts believe the two major factors are playing a role in this, the currency market situation, where the ruble has been rapidly growing stronger again, and the second factor, the consumer demand dynamic. 
I would like to emphasize that after a surge in February and March, consumer activity has objectively dis declined. It is very important not to lose control of the situation and to prevent a misbalance in economic dynamics. On the one hand, we need to ensure gradual normalization of pricing dynamics, and in, on the other, it is essential to prevent a serious reduction in demand, which could lead to setbacks in the operation of companies and a decrease in budget revenues. So in the current situation, it is necessary to support domestic companies to enable them to increase the supply of goods and services. It is also important to encourage domestic demand and the purchasing power of the population. So in other words, the emphasis from this point on is on the real economy. The financial situation in Russia has been stabilized. The financial system is working properly. So now the emphasis can be on taking steps to support the domestic economy, the real economy. And by the way, the person who spoke directly after Putin and who's clearly taking the key decisions now is Elvira Nabulina, the chairman of the central bank. And I would say, I know she's got her critics, but overall, I think she's doing a very good job in this rather taxing situation. I'm going to make one further observation. I think a lot of the pressure in the West on trying to get Russia to default, to try to engineer a Russian default, pressure which is legally dubious and which calls into question whether there would in fact be a default, is based on a misunderstanding. This is this misunderstanding is conditioned on events that took place in Russia in 1998 when the Russian government did default on its external debt obligations and also came, something which came very close to happening during the financial crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008. In both cases... The fact, especially in 1998, the fact that the Russian government seemed for a time to be unable to meet its payment obligations in 1998, of course, it actually defaulted, caused the collapse of the Russian banking system. And I think many of the moves that we have seen taken by Western governments this time have been intended to achieve the same thing. This is based on a failure to understand how much the financial system in Russia has changed since the events of 1998 and 2008. Up to those that time, at that time, in 1998 and in 2008, the Russian financial system, the banking system, depended overwhelmingly on external funding, on foreign currency loans provided by European banks and financial institutions. So when the Russian government defaulted, those governments and institutions in 1998 refused to lend more and in many cases pulled back, and that caused the banking system to collapse like a house of cards. And in 2008, when there was massive problems in the Western banking system, those financial institutions and those Western financial institutions also pulled money out of Russia, which also ca came very close to causing the financial system in Russia to collapse at that time. Today, it is completely different. The Russian financial system is now largely independent of external sources of funding. It depends overwhelmingly on internal domestic funding from Russian savers and Russian institutions. The result is that an externally engineered default, especially an artificial one, and a withdrawal of Western funding, which is anyway now far more limited than it was, proportionately speaking, in 1998 and 2008, and indeed 2014, when the first sanctions were in introduced, it's going to have a much smaller effect on the financial system 
in Russia today than it did before. Once more, I think Western governments and Western planners have not understood how much more sophisticated and solid the Russian economy is than it once was. And I think that they have basically taken steps based upon outdated ideas of how the Russian economic system actually works nowadays. The where, the other meeting that Putin attended, which is an enormously lengthy meeting, was one um, with the Russian um, procuracy. This is the prosecution authority. You could call it, if you like, the uh, Attorney General's Office, the department, the Russian equivalent of the Department of Justice in the United States. And um, I'm going to be, I'm going to just quote again some of the things that he, Putin said. He said that the special operation has exposed multiple op violations of international law by U Ukrainian groups, as well as foreign mercenaries. And then he goes on to say that to our surprise, high-ranking diplomats in Europe and the United States are urging their Ukrainian satellites to use their resources to win on the battlefield. Our partners in the United States are using such strange diplomacy. Diplom diplomats are even calling for this. But as they realize that this is impossible, they try to achieve a different objective instead, to split Russian society, to destroy Russia from within. But here too, there is a hitch. This hasn't worked either. Our society has shown maturity and solidarity. It supports our armed forces and supports our efforts to ensure Russia's ultimate security and help the people living in Donbass. This is Putin's words, I want to stress. This means support for our people living in Donbass. So when they, and Putin here means the West, fail to achieve their information goals, they continue to, to fool their citizens, of course, using their monopoly position in the country's information space and in some other countries, but they ha failed here on the territory of Russia. And then he goes on to say, they switched, switched to terror to arranging the murder of our journalists. And this is where it becomes all rather interesting. And here I'm going to be careful about quoting Putin's words. Because what he's basically saying, his allegation, and I stress it's only an allegation, is that the Ukrainians sent a sabotage group to murder a Russian journalist, Vladimir Solovyov. But Putin is hinting that Western agencies, Western services, and he says primarily the CIA, but others, had a hand in this and that they are actually working with the Ukrainian special services to murder Russian journalists. I have to say that is a very, very serious allegation. I've not seen any evidence that this is so, but Putin, of course, says it is. And he calls on Russian prosecutors to work towards setting up trials of those who are involved. And he gives a rather ominous warning about these Western intelligence officials who are involved in these sort of things, that the Russians know exactly who these people are, that they have, if you like, well, they're able to identify these people, they know who they know their names, perhaps their locations. I found it a rather chilling warning altogether. I hope we're not going to find ourselves in a situation where the two sides start sending assassins to kill each other and perhaps to kidnap each other's people. That would be a very serious and alarming escalation indeed. Well, on that rather ominous note, I'm going to finish this programme. I hope you will join me for more programmes on this channel. In the meantime, do remember that you can find us on other platforms. I mentioned Locals and Rumble at the start of this programme, but of course we're also on other channels, on other platforms too, such as Super U. And you can also find us 
um, on, as I say, on those platforms. And you can support us also via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. You can go to our shop and buy the amazing things you will find there, uh, um, like our hats, hoodies, sweatshirts, t-shirts, and magic mugs. And of course, don't forget, if you've liked this video, to press the like button and also please check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.